As always, great to be here with you all. My name is Jason Fisher. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, just kind of on the heels of what Blake just shared, we're really excited for him uh, to be able to take, take, a, take this month, not really off, he's going to be working really hard. In fact, I'm glad it's him and not me. Uh, but uh, just writing and so forth, and so we're really glad that he's going to be able to, to do that. And uh, you should know, you know, his, his heart really in doing this is to serve and to equip the body of Christ, uh, in this case, our church, uh, to just better lead and, and better equip us together as a church body to be the people of God. And so uh, we're, we're excited for him to be able to take this chance. So I want to pray for him real quick, and then we're going to jump into our passage for the day. So Lord, just want to pray for Blake as he takes this time aside to write. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just uh, give him clarity. Lord, uh, I know that he is so disciplined already and that that is a gift from you. Uh, so just I pray that he would just enjoy that gift to be able to just really set aside time to get after it. But Lord, I pray that the words would come, that the thoughts would flow, and uh, Lord, that just he would have a lot of clarity. And I pray for him and Brittany and, and the kids just uh, that this would be uh, just a different, special, kind of unique season for them. Uh, of ministry and, and serving you and your people. So we're thankful for him and uh, just the many ways that he pastors all of us and uh, his leadership and excited to see how you're going to uh, grow him and then us in turn through that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you're just kind of joining us, welcome. So glad that you're here. Uh, we are doing a series right now. We have one more week left of parables. And then uh, after next week, we're going to do uh, a six-week series called In the Valley of the Shadow, where we're going to talk about some difficult things like loneliness, grief, shame, doubt, those sorts of things, and, and what is the Bible, how does God minister to us in the midst of those. But uh, for now, uh, and, and next week, we're, we're in parables in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, parable, as you may recall, is it's a simple story to communicate a deeper truth. And Jesus would often teach in parables because he wanted to draw people to himself. He, he, he wanted to leave people with more questions to go, hey, tell us more about this. And so we see the disciples doing this and, and demonstrating that eagerness to know more from Jesus. Uh, and today we're going to be uh, looking at a section where Jesus is talking about the fact that God loves to seek and find, uh, that there, there's lostness in this world, that we all experience this lostness, but that God seeks and he finds. And as, as I was reflecting on, on this, I have to admit sort of my inability to find things that I seek after. This is, I'm not very godly in, the, in this matter. Uh, it's a source of tension in our house at times. When I'm looking for something, you know, I'll open up the pantry door and I'm looking for a can of corn or something like that. And it's literally right there and there's lights going off and it's making an alarm sound and so forth. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't see it. I don't. I, don't, I can't find it. And then Shannon comes along, and she has a digital blueprint in her brain of everything that exists in our house and is able to, like, beep, bop, boop, boop, beep, beep, and then locate that thing and then make me feel about this big in the process. No, she doesn't do that uh, anymore. She's way more godly in her ability to find the things that she's looking for it's a superpower, and uh, I don't know, is anybody else there with me where you're just like, hey, can you just tell me where this is before I go wasting my time looking for it, you know? And then we argue, and it's a whole big thing, but uh, um, that's, uh, I'm a work in progress here. Uh, the beautiful thing, though, that Jesus demonstrates in these parables is that God finds the things that he seeks for. Uh, and, and there's a series of parables that culminates in the one that we're going to be looking at today. So open in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Um, we got a big section here, but we're going to read through this. Uh, you're probably really familiar with it. I would say if I had to vote, cast my vote, this is probably, um, it's probably neck and neck with the Good Samaritan as the most kind of famous parable in, in my estimation. But... Um, 
I, I hope that we would look at it through fresh eyes, even if you're very familiar with it, because my, my intent uh, right from the get-go is that we would allow ourselves to be drawn into this. I really do think that we're supposed to see ourselves in this story in some way. So along the way, I'm going to be asking us to reflect and go, in what ways do you relate to this person or this situation? But let's kind of put ourselves in this. Let's try to see the sights and feel the feelings and smell the smells, so to speak. And Jesus says, starting in verse 11, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he had come to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against, sorry, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He's, he was lost and is found. What I'd like to do is look at each person in turn. Kind of glean what we can from this parable that Jesus tells us. So let's look at the younger son. The younger son is marked by rebellion. He severed his relationship with his father. In fact, when he asked for his inheritance, we need to understand what it is that he was saying because the inheritance wouldn't be distributed until the father had died. But the father was still alive. So the younger son has the audacity to come to his living father and say, essentially what he's saying is, your good is dead to me. Give me what I've got coming to me. I don't want to wait anymore until you actually die. Thank you very much. And so the father graciously gives him his inheritance. He severed his relationship with his father. So much so that he severs his relationship with his whole family, with his whole community in which he grew up. He went off to a distant land, to a distant country where he knew no one. Essentially, he wanted a clean break, a fresh start. And so in his rebellion... He treats his father as good as dead and everybody else around him and he turns his back on them and he departs to a distant country. 
with, distant, with a different language, perhaps, a different culture, completely severed his relationship. And then what does he do? He squanders everything, right? In his rebellion, he doesn't even treat the inheritance that was given to him graciously by his father with any kind of respect or honor. He just squanders it recklessly uh, on all sorts of reckless living. And these are not just fin- like bad financial choices. Like he, it's not like he like, you know, uh, was trying to do the right thing. And, no, he woke up and he chose irresponsibility. He just decided that's what he was going to do. He was going to live for today. And then, of course, he hits rock bottom. We don't know how long it took. It doesn't seem like it took very long. So he severs his relationship with his father and everybody he knows. He goes off and he squanders everything that he has. He gives it away. I'm sure he made a lot of good friends in that, in that time, but when the money runs out, where, where are they? They're nowhere to be found because it says specifically, Jesus says, no one gave him anything. He hits rock bottom. He's at the end of his rope. And of course, this is kind of an accelerated story here. But it's a familiar story, isn't it? He becomes a pig feeder. To Jesus' Jewish audience, that's like the lowest of the lowest. You wouldn't want to even come near pigs. Those are unclean animals, much less to be a pig feeder, much less to like hunger for the pig slop that they're eating. In every way, he has hit rock bottom. He's drooling over pig slop. He's so hungry. He's starving. He's penniless. Wrecked now just with shame of where he's found himself. He's alone, a nobody, in a place where he has no friends, no family. He's an outcast, an outsider. He's hit rock bottom. He has nothing and no one. Rembrandt painted a painting of the return of the prodigal son. It's it's a wonderful painting. I'll put it up here for us to look at just for a moment. And you see on the left side is the father, and he has his hands on the back of his younger son who's returned. Look at this painting just for a moment. What do you notice about this younger son here? You don't need to say it out loud, but just make some observations about what you see. What is, what is uh, Rembrandt and his sort of rendition of this? Of course, you know, this, this uh, scene isn't exactly re- represented in the parable, but, but he captures the sort of the feel of it here. We see this guy who is just, I and mean, he's just wearing just gross, disgusting clothes. He's actually missing a shoe. I think if you look close enough, he has scars on his feet. The fact that his head is shaved is notable. Typically, you know, it, it represents uh, kind of a, someone who's just worthless, anonymous even. He's filthy. And he's on his knees in front of his father. Do you relate to this younger son? Shame, guilt over the things that you've done and said. Maybe you're even at rock bottom right now. Like that's how you would describe where you're at. You just feel spiritually, emotionally, socially, relationally empty. You feel like you have no one and nothing. You're probably hearing lies. Maybe these are lies that this younger son was hearing while he was sitting there with the pigs before he came to his senses. Things like, it's too late. I can't go back. God won't take me. You don't know what I've done or said or thought. I've squandered way too much for you or anybody else to take me back to receive any kind of compassion. I have to prove myself. 
I have to work my way back into favor with God. Is that where you're at? Is that a lie that you're hearing? I've used up all my chances. I'm too far gone. I've dishonored everybody else around me. It's over. If you feel this way, there's hope. There's hope that Jesus wants us to hear in this parable. Because the Father, God our Father, forgives. He loves. And he has compassion. He wants us to return home. And so we see this change in this person. I think that we need to pause for a moment and look at this younger son and see what happens at the edge of the pig's die. At that rock bottom place. Because I think he demonstrates for us repentance. And I'm kind of thinking about this in terms of this anatomy of repentance. And so this is for all of us, whether you feel like you're at rock bottom or not. We're constantly in this place where we're returning to God. We're repenting. That's what that means. And, and so I just want to walk through here real quick um, what, what repentance is. And I've got this, this kind of a silly little diagram up here. But as, as I was looking at this, I noticed like this is a, this is a whole body thing. There's a, there's a wholeness to the repentance that he demonstrates and that I think that God is calling us to. It's not a partial thing. It's not just giving lip service to God. Oh, I repent. I want to change. Or, or having this sense of this this feeling like, hey, my life isn't what it's supposed to be right now, but then sort of being stuck in that wallowing in that self-pity, that's not repentance. We can't just think about it and not do anything either. And so what the son does is he demonstrates this, this, this whole repentance. It's a whole body thing. There's a longing in his heart to return. He recognizes he has not forgotten that he's the son of his father. In fact, uh, Henry Nouwen wrote a whole book on this. We don't need to go back, but in the painting, he actually still has a little sword by his side, which would have been emblematic of his family. Everything else he lost and gave away or sold, but he held on to the reality that he still belongs to the father. And in his heart, something in him never forgot that he belonged at home. Maybe that's you. You've got that longing in your heart like, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. That's from God. His kindness leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that pulls on the heart, our heartstrings to return. And then, and then he engages his intellect, his mind. There's this admission of guilt. When he rehearses in his mind what he's going to say to his dad, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. He recognizes that, that in our sin and rebellion, it is against God, but before you also. He recognizes a mission of guilt with his head. And then with his hands, he releases this sense of entitlement. I don't deserve to be called your son, but would you let me be a servant in your home? Just let me come home so I can have some bread and a little, some better clothes on my back. And then he engages his feet. He acts. He goes. Specifically, it says that he arose. He got up. He arose. Because action brings the rest of it into reality. This is the anatomy of repentance. And so he goes. And this is not to discount the fact that God searches after us, that he pursues us. The Bible talks about that a ton. But the Bible also talks about a need in our heart and our willingness to turn and engage him. God does not force himself on us. He lovingly pursues us. But he also calls us to a a whole body repentance. Maybe you're stuck right now and you realize that, man, I've been, I've been missing part of this. I've been feeling it in here, but I've not engaged it in my head or vice versa. Or maybe you're stuck in inaction. Arising for us might mean talking to somebody in your life, someone you trust and respect 
and go, I feel stuck. I feel distant from God. What should I do? And of course, he's restored. We have this beautiful picture. I love this image of the son coming home. He's rehearsing in his head. He's got scars on his feet because his sandals have worn through. He's disheveled. He's probably in some ways beyond recognition. But who recognizes him? The father. It says that he sees him from a long way off. It's as though every time the father wakes up in the morning, he looks at the horizon in hopes that his son is returning. And this morning, he's there. He sees him. And you know how you can tell, like, you recognize someone that you know really well from a distance because by the way they walk? The father recognizes his own. And he runs to him. He doesn't wait with his arms crossed, rehearsing in his mind how he's going to scold his son. Maybe that's a lie you believe about the father. Now he runs to him. This is, this, is, this is a demonstration of indignity, by the way. A dignified man in this culture would not run. He runs to his father, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. And, and the son tries to get his speech out, but the father, in his grace and love, says, Nonsense. I'm going to fully restore you. And this is the complete restoration that we see for this son who had been rebellious, who had severed everything and is returning home. He restores the relationship with the father. He's forgiven. And in this image of the robe, the ring, and the sandals on his feet, we see a restoration of honor. It's a complete 180 from the shame that he was experiencing at the edge of the, the pig slop. Restoration of honor, a restoration of inheritance or wealth with the ring on his finger. I mean, imagine that. He's now adopted back into the family, which means he's going to get more inheritance. That's insane. And then sandals on his feet, a restored status. In those days, it was servants who didn't wear anything on their feet. And now he's restored him in his status as son. He's fully restored, not just the relationship to himself, but a relationship to his community in throwing this party. This fattened calf that had been waiting for some party is now put to use as he restores his son to, back to his family and friends. It's full, complete restoration. And this is an image of the restoration that we are promised through Jesus Christ. Even though all of us have left home, All of us have, have rejected God and squandered the good gift. We need to see ourselves, all of us, at some time in our life, maybe it's now, maybe it was in the past, as the younger son. In our sin, we are distant, we have, squ we have severed relationship with God the Father, we have squandered the gifts that he's given us, and we've alienated ourselves. And yet God, in his mercy and in his love, he seeks and he finds and fully restores us. The Bible talks about this, about honor, about inheritance, about status as God's children, all of these things. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus like me, you're like, I don't fully feel it yet. But there's a promise that when Christ returns and re restores all things, we will. We're promised these things. But even now, we get to walk in the reality of being daughters and sons of God the Father. Let's take a look at the older son. Meanwhile, the older son, he's out in the field, and he comes over, right? He's, he's hearing something. He's, he's walking up to the house, and he's hearing the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're partying inside, and he's all like, what's going on in there? The older son, he's self-righteous. He's not rebellious. Doesn't look like it but he's self-righteous. Listen to the things that he says. As, he, as, the, as the father comes out, which is also an act of indignity, that the host of the party has to leave the party for his oldest son. And he's like, son, what's happening? Like, come on in. And in his self-righteousness, he says, look, these many years I've served you. Oh, he's loyal. 
He's loyal. He's even been working in the field while this party's going on. He's a hard worker. He knows what needs to be done and he gets after it. I've never disobeyed your command, he says. He's dutiful. Yet you never even gave me a young goat, not to mention the fattened calf, just so I could have a party with my friends. The subtext here is, why haven't you, keep, why haven't you been keeping score, Dad, like I have? You ever find yourself there? You realize you're keeping score and God's not? Self-righteousness happens when we are reliant on our own commitment and our own ability to be good. If we go back to the picture, the Rembrandt picture here, uh, most people believe, not everybody, but most people believe that Rem, when he painted this, he wanted, he wanted us to see the older son standing off to the right. And I think that's right. I mean, the father and, and he are both wearing the same color robe. What do you notice about him, though? He's the tallest guy in the room, right? Looking down. Maybe even with an air of judgment. I mean, he looks put together. But self-righteousness, as we see, it's like a shiny apple. And you pick that apple and it's beautiful and it's red and it looks delicious. And then you bite into it and to your horror, you discover that it's rotting with worms inside. That's what self-righteousness is. It's a dependence on our own loyalty and dutifulness and the ability to get things done. And it it manifests itself in things like resentment. The older son is resentful. That's what self-righteousness does. He's sort of predisposed to suspicion and resentment. And when we're self-righteous, when we're relying on our own ability to impress God and others around us, our own holiness, and resentment, is, it's, like, it's right there always at the ready. Judgment, looking down on others, resenting perhaps even the grace given to those who have squandered their lives. He won't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours. <laughs> He's disowned him as an outcast. I don't want to be like this older brother in that or any of that. There are people in the world around us, I think, that we tend to disown as outcasts. Yeah, they're made in the image of God in some sort of, you know, important theological sense, but as far as actually interacting with people who are part of the LGBTQ community, for instance, or are, are, are struggling with, with, with deep gender issues and so forth? Are we a church community that is too self-righteous for them? Where we essentially tell God, yeah, these people of yours, and we essentially and effectively disown them, and the list goes on of all sorts of people that we could look at and judge and treat as outcasts, and yet recognizing that the grace of God is out there for everyone, that God is, is seeking and, and looking and, and hoping to find the lost who are dying apart from him and his grace and his love. And the father extends the same grace that he gave his younger son to the older son, but the older son is resistant his self-righteousness shows itself in resentment and resistance. In distancing himself from his brother, he distanced himself from his father. He's so hung up on this outcast brother of his that he won't even go into the party. 
Functionally, throughout his life, he was close to the father, but his heart was far from him. He was actually offended by his father's compassion towards his brother. Jesus leaves a cliffhanger here. It's unresolved. We don't know what the younger brother does. We have no idea how this story ends. But I think it's because it's a complete your own story. Jesus was, so if you go back all the way up to the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people. And what were they doing? They were criticizing him for hanging out with the outcasts. And a lot of those outcasts, they were, they were, they were the ones who had, had turned their back on God. They were sexually rogue. They were the destitute. They were the rebellious. They were sinners. And these Pharisees and scribes, they had been criticizing Jesus for hanging out with those people. People who were more like the younger brother. And so Jesus leaves this cliffhanger, and I think we're supposed to ask, in what ways are you like the older brother? Come on, don't be shy. Self-righteousness is alive and well in our church. I know because it's in me. I can relate at times in my life to the younger brother, but if I'm honest, I relate more to the older brother. I've grown up in the church. I've been around all this. God could very easily say to me, hey, what I have is is yours. What's yours is mine. Like, you've been with me this whole time. Do you, like me, have a tendency towards a self-righteousness, a self-reliance on our own ability to be loyal to God and to put in our time for Him? I think that for the self-righteous among us, the key to restoration with the Father is is to understand that our need for forgiveness ongoing, but it's also to join him in his compassion for the younger son, those around us who are rebellious. It's that same principle that Jesus teaches where we're, we're to forgive as God forgives. If we're unwilling to forgive, then we've not really come to terms with the forgiveness that we've received from the Father. And the same goes for our compassion, the love that we have for those around us, so that they too might find reconciliation with the Father, that they too might find forgiveness and home. And so lastly, we look at the Father. Tim Keller uh, recently passed away. He's a, a pastor and theologian and writer. Uh, he wrote a, a little book I love. I, I encourage you to go out and read it. It's called The Prodigal God, and he sort of uh, dissects this, this whole parable. But it's called The Prodigal God. We, we typically know it as the prodigal son because um, uh, that's just how we know it. And we often think of it in terms of prodigal, meaning um, someone who goes away and then comes back again. Like the prodigal son has returned, right? That's actually not the definition of prodigal. That's, that's not what prodigal means. Keller points out to us that actually prodigal means spending recklessly or extravagantly wasteful. That's the definition, Oxford de- definition of prodigal. Extravagantly wasteful. And when we think of God in terms of that, we see that he's the one who spends most quote-unquote recklessly. And I use that term loosely because God's not being irresponsible. But it's overwhelming. The love and the compassion and the restoration that he, 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 sh- he lavishes upon the younger son is, in, is immensely extravagant. It even seems impossible. And we see this about God. That God, the the father, while he was a long way off, still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. This is a wonderful reminder to us. You know know what's worse than being lost? Forgotten. God does not forget. Forget. 
our Father remembers. He sees you. He remembers you. He's looking for you, even if you're a long way off. His love is overwhelming. It seems impossible. It's extravagant. And this is a wonderful definition and description of a God who goes to great lengths to find us. God loves you so much. He has gone to what we would consider impossible lengths to pursue you. He became a human. And in some ways, in many ways not at all like the younger son, but Jesus leaves home for us. He he enters a distant land. But he doesn't do it in rebellion. He does it in obedience to the Father, out of love for the Father and love for the world. And he gives up everything for us. He dies on a cross and then comes to life again three days later. That is how much God loves us, that that he left heaven for us to demonstrate his grace, his his love, his compassion towards us. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I encourage you to, to reconsider, just to come to terms once again with the lavish love, the compassion that God has showered upon you by sending his only son to rescue us, to bring us home so that we might be called his children. And whether you're rebellious or self-righteous, there's forgiveness and restoration for us all. And maybe you, like both of these sons, are at a decision point. The younger son came, he came to a decision point there when he was at rock bottom to repent, to turn, to arise, and to go home. And to, and to risk it all in hopes of some kind of restoration. And he's met there with more than he could ever possibly imagine. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're at that decision point. But maybe you're more like the older son who was standing there at a decision point. Am I going to join the Father in His love and His compassion and in so doing receive and enter into His love and compassion? Or am I going to stand outside the party and rely on my own loyal dutifulness, my ability to play by the rules and play the game well? Am I going to rely on my own ability to be religious? We all have these decision points. But God wants to spend his love recklessly on us. And so let's go to him in prayer. And just ask him to make that known to us again as we turn our hearts towards communion. Wherever you are, whether you are more like the rebellious son or the self-righteous son, it's the same father. It's the same compassion, the same mercy, the same love. So God, we come to you and we just ask you to minister to our hearts. Lord, we need your grace and your compassion. We thank you that you do not forget, but that you seek and save the lost, just as Jesus said. Lord, we want to just confess our longing to you. Admit to you, Lord, that we We're so far off in our ability to play by the rules or impress you. And God, give us the courage to to turn and to repent and to receive your, your grace and your forgiveness, God. I pray, God, that you'd stir in our hearts as we remember here this morning the sacrifice of Christ, his obedience, his humility, but also, Lord, his glory. And we await today, we await 
Lord Jesus, your return. And we want to we wanna live like you. We want to be obedient to you and follow after you, but let us not rely on those things. Let us remember that we're relying on you and the work that you've done on the cross that's brought us forgiveness and restored us to a place of honor and inheritance and status with you. We pray in your name. Amen. Ushers can come forward at this time, and if you're a follower of Christ, I invite you to come forward to receive these elements, the bread being his body given for us and the cup, his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. And you take those back to your seat and on your own time, just receive those. Maybe take some time to reflect, to pray. Maybe even right now, enter into that decision point once again that we have as it relates to our Heavenly Father.